Our first reading today is taken from Isaiah 42, verses 1 to 17, which you can find on page 728 of the Church Bibles. So that's Isaiah 42, 1 to 17, starting at verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. Thus says God the Lord, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison, those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing to the Lord a new song, his praise from the end of the earth, you who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. Let the desert and its cities lift up their voice, the villages that Kedar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. The Lord goes out like a mighty man. Like a man of war, he stirs up his zeal. He cries out. He shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know, in paths that they have not known. I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame who trust in carved idols, who say to metal images, you are our gods. Our second reading is from Matthew 12 and can be found on page 985 of the Church Bibles. That's Matthew chapter 12 on page 985. Starting to read out verse 15. Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all, and ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or quiet cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smouldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. It's a great pleasure to be with you again at the 4pm 
And we're continuing our series in Isaiah, as we are aware. Especially warm welcome if you're here on the back of the week of talks. There might be just one or two. And if that's you, um, really very good to have you with us. We're listening to Isaiah, who was writing some 700 years before the coming of Christ. And we may be understandably wondering whether we've been here before um, or if uh, this is our first time. What does a prophet speaking some 2,700 years uh, go in the past to an obscure little nation in the backwaters of the Middle East have anything to do with us? But Isaiah's message is profoundly relevant, I want to say to us, because he is answering the question which is of primary relevance to all of us human beings throughout all of time. And that question is, what hope is there for us and for our ruined world? The Bible's message is very clear that the world that we live in now that is so messed up and broken isn't the way it should have been. The world was built and ordered and beautiful and good in the beginning. God made it right. God in his right place, us as human beings in our right place as privileged rulers under our creator. But when as humanity we pulled ourselves out of our place in that beautiful construction and tried to topple God, instead God in his judgment caused the whole thing to come crashing down. And from the ruins of humanity, out of his kindness, God picked one man, Abraham, and promised to begin again with this man and his descendants, the chosen people. And from them he would make a prototype for this world to show what it was like to live in relationship with God And more than that, to make them the foundation stone for a new humanity and a new world. And that nation became Israel, which is the main player in the first half of the Bible. And that is who Isaiah's prophecy is addressed to back in chapter 1 and right throughout. But Isaiah's prophecy opens and it looks like the plan has gone terribly, terribly wrong. Don't turn to it, but chapter 1 of Isaiah verse 2 at the very beginning starts like this. Children I have reared... And brought up have rebelled against me. He goes on to describe them as stupid oxes and donkeys who don't know their master's crib. And what follows is a devastating exposure and prosecution of the nation of Israel, one that is corrupt and immoral and spiritually sick to the very core. And so, what hope is there for humanity if Israel is meant to be the glimmer of light, the building block for this new world? What hope is there when they are such a mess? Yet set against this picture in chapter 2, immediately next to it, is an extraordinary and beautiful vision from God of the future, of the new world, of a new Jerusalem, of Israel at the very center of the world, of the nation streaming in and coming to hear about God, the God of Israel, and to receive the blessing of Israel, and having the promise of Abraham realized in this picture, humanity at peace again with our maker, humanity back in harmony with each other. And the point of chapters 1 to 39 is that there is hope. Time and time again, despite the failure of Israel, there is hope for this world. But the question then arises, how? How is it going to be brought about? How is this new world going to come? And that is the subject of our chapters, chapters 40 to 55. Isaiah is writing from his own day in these chapters, but he's speaking into the future some hundred years plus into the future. The people of Israel are at their very lowest point in all of their history. They're in exile in Babylon, by the waters of Babylon, weeping because they've been sent into that country in judgment by God. And we've seen over the last few weeks like a splash of cold water in the desert. Chapter 40 opens with those words, comfort, comfort my people Israel. And what follows is God's answer to the problem of the world and of Israel. And the answer is that he himself will intervene in this spectacular and extraordinary way. He who holds the very oceans of the hands in his palm is powerful enough to do it. He who loves his people like a shepherd loves his sheep is good enough and willing enough to do it. And in the verses immediately prior to our passage, we find God in the middle of a prosecution exposing the emptiness of idols so that Israel won't go to the idols to look for the rescue. Perhaps you could turn back to it. Chapter 41, verse 24 says this, Behold, you idols, you're nothing, and your work is less than nothing. An abomination is he who chooses you. And again, a second time, behold, verse 29. 
They are all a delusion. Their works are nothing. Their mental images, their metal images are an empty wind. Behold, behold. And then chapter 42 begins with that same word, behold. And what are we to expect? At this point, we might expect a third indictment against the idols. But instead, out of the blue, in this most spectacular and unexpected way, we are presented with this figure. Not with an idol, but with the servant. Verse 1, behold, my servant. And what we find here in this new and unanticipated way is a new piece to the jigsaw puzzle. Answering the question, how is God going to bring about his great rescue? Chapters 40 and 41, the Lord will do it. But now how? Through this unexpected and surprising servant. What we have here is the first of four sketches throughout the chapters of uh, chapter 40 to 55 of Isaiah. And three more times we'll see portraits of this figure. And there isn't enough time to go through everything in detail here. And because the themes are so interwoven, I hope you'll excuse me that we won't go through verse by verse as we normally do. Instead, I just want to point out three features, three characteristics of this portrait that we have and begin helping us marvel at this figure who we see. First thing I want to draw our attention to is his identity. And he is the one who is called my chosen, my delight. I wonder if you'd look with me to verse one. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit Upon him. And the very first thing to notice is the extraordinary surprise it is that there is, a, that is even such a figure, that there is this servant. And that is a massive surprise, I think, if we've been paying attention in chapters 40 and 41. Because in those verses, time and time and time again, God has been speaking about his uniqueness, that he is the only God, that he is the true God, that the idols are false gods and there is no one like him. Chapter 40, verse 25, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. The point is that no one compares to him. The idols are false and lifeless. He is the only true God. He alone has the power and the desire to rescue his people. And he will not tolerate rivals. We see that in our own reading in verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I give to no other. Yet somehow, this other figure steps onto the scene. Somehow, this figure will bring about the Lord's rescue, but in some way will not take away from the Lord's glory. Distinct from the Lord himself, yes, but somehow not a threat to him, not a rival. And that seems seems to be because of this uniquely close relationship we see between the servant and between the Lord. A relationship which has been unmatched in any time in history up to this point. Here is verse 1, my servant. There have been other servants leading up to this point God used at various times in history, Moses and David and Israel itself and others. But here God is saying, this is my servant, the ultimate one. He is the one in whom the Lord's soul delights, verse 1. Every other human being in history has not been a delight ultimately to the Lord. They've been a disappointment. But this servant is different. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees him and his heart sings and his face smiles. Every moment of this life of this servant is authentic and it's good and loyal and pure and beautiful. And again, verse 1, the Lord says, I have put my spirit upon him. Others in the past have had God's spirit for a short time for special tasks But the servant will somehow know the presence of God's spirit with him all the time, uniquely empowering him, equipping him for his task, enlightening him for his service. This is uniquely God's man with God's presence in a way unheralded before. The implications of verse 4, I think, are huge and we could have missed it. I wonder if you'd look with me to verse 4. The coastlands, that is the ends of the earth, wait for his law. Did you notice who is the subject? Always in the Bible, the law uh, is the Lord's law. But here it is the law of the servant, the teaching, the Torah, the authoritative instruction. 
Somehow, this servant will bring his own teaching that is going to reach the coastlands, the ends of the earth, beyond Israel. And somehow, his teaching will not contradict the Lord's teaching. Somehow, it's going to be completely aligned. You can imagine the exiles sitting there by the rivers of Babylon, scratching their heads and wondering, how could this possibly be? Things being said about this man are close to blasphemous because of the closeness in the relationship. But it does seem to come from the prophet Isaiah. How is it going to be? God's identity, uh, the, the servant's identity, the chosen one. A man with whom there is this closeness and intimacy unlike ever before. But also, his mission. And his mission is to bring justice. Justice is what the Lord says over and over again in verses 1 to 4 that the servant is going to bring to this world. Verse one, he will bring forth justice to the nations. Verse three, he will faithfully bring forth justice. Verse four, he will not grow faint or be discouraged. He will bring justice. The word justice here translates the Hebrew word mishpat. Very rarely will we ever uh, try and draw out one of the original words in our sermons. It doesn't tend to bring any help really. But I think in this case, it is helpful because our word justice might make us think of a restricted meaning, something like the overturning of an unjust prison sentence or something like that. But the Bible's idea of the word is much bigger than that. And we'll see that as we see the word justice used in Isaiah. It is rather the opposite of what we see back in chapter 5, verse 7 of Isaiah. The Lord looks out onto Israel to see justice, to see mishpat, but instead, he sees bloodshed, or mishpach, which is as ugly as it sounds. Now, please excuse me, those in the front row, if you wouldn't mind wiping your faces. But that is the world today. It is no different. It is a world of mishpach, bloodshed, a world disordered, not as it should be. And that is what the servant will bring. He will bring mishpat, the world that has been reordered according to God's law, where people are back in harmony with their God, and with each other, where bloodshed is over, where divorce courts are closed, where war zones are emptied, where there is no need for alarms on houses or locks on doors or security guards, where there's no more safeguarding or defamation cases or health and safety regulations, where we'll open up the browser and see on the news nothing about missile testing or political division or scandals of sex abuse. And that is all because somehow, verse 4, this servant is going to bring mishpat, the world as it should be, the world living under God's perfect rule, the world in harmony again. And not just for some obscure part of the Middle East did we see, for the coastlands, for the ends of the earth, for the nations of the world, people who knew nothing of God, who were trapped in idolatry, somehow they will receive the law of the Lord through this servant and he will bring Mishpat. Verses 6 and 7, I think, give us a, another layer of detail explaining this idea of Mishpat. He will bring light out of darkness, is the point there. The middle of verse 6 says, I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes of those that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. Fumbling around in the darkness stumbling in our blindness, stumbling and, fo- and slumped behind bars in prison. That's the description of us and our world apart from God. It's a picture of God's judgment against us for our sin as humanity. We've been cut off from God, from his light and his life and his freedom. But the Lord is going to give this servant to free us. Verse 6, he will give him, that is he will make him a gift and he'll make him a covenant for the people's. Right throughout the Bible, covenants are the way that people interact and join in relationship with God. But here is one who is the covenant. Come to him and you will have access to God himself. No longer cut off from God, but able to have relationship with him. And he is the one who's going to bring light to the nations, verse 6. His arrival means the darkness will be chased away by the light. Where there was ignorance, ignorance, there is now knowledge. Where there was blindness, we can now see God. Somehow this servant is going to enter the dungeon of judgment and overcome it and lead people out of that darkness into the freedom of forgiveness 
and relationship with God. And you can imagine them there in exile in Babylon, the Israelites longing for this future rescue. The immediate situation from them was the need for physical rescue from exile. They were refugees in this foreign country. But what God is saying here is that a much deeper problem and a much deeper solution is needed. They need freedom and exile, uh, exodus from their spiritual exile. They need an exodus-type rescue like God first did, taking them out of Egypt and bringing them into a promised land, but this time much bigger, taking them out of the judgment and slavery of their sin and bringing them back into a new world, into a new mishpat under God. And he will do it through his servant. That is the servant's identity. The servant's mission is his mishpat for the world, but finally is his method, the way he's going to bring it all about. And the answer is that he's going to do it in this completely remarkable way. He's going to do it with gentleness and humility. I wonder if we'd look down to verse 2. He will not cry out aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. And again, as the original readers would have heard this, they would have been totally bewildered. The first Exodus rescue was what you'd expect from God of the universe. Hailstorms and fire, boils and locusts, all the magnificent and great and awesome display of the power of the Lord. That's what you'd expect when God comes in rescue. You'd expect him to strike down his enemy Pharaoh just as he did. You'd expect him to oppose all that stand in his way. And again, that is what Israel must have expected would happen for God to rescue them. But that isn't the way of this servant. That's not how this new exodus, this greater exodus, is going to happen. When he comes to bring the mishpat for the nations, it won't be with armies storming palaces or bringing down the reigning superpower. There won't be tanks in the street. There won't be public announcements on CNN and BBC News. No, verse 2, he won't cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it known in the street. This wasn't, one doesn't come with a PR machine and a writing team putting puff pieces in weekend papers about his hobbies and his family life. There's no Twitter account pumping out his every thought and all of his great achievements. Now he goes about in a totally unworldly way, unlike the powerful and important in this world. In the place of self-serving promotion, there will be quiet and humble service. You go along a river and you walk in the summer and there are some reeds poking out from the water. One is bent over and a bit bruised and broken, so you snap it off and you chuck it into the water. Well, it's the end of a dinner party and the guests have come and you've tried to pull out all the stops to impress them, so you've got candles. And as you're clearing up, you just go along and snuff out some of those faintly burning wicks. But that isn't the way of this servant. Verse 3 a bruised reed he will not break, and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. And the bruised reed and the smoldering wick are us of this world. People who are suffering, people who are weak and needy because of our sin and our rebellion and our experiencement at the hand of God's judgment. But this servant isn't one like the rest of this world. Rather than snapping us off and snuffing us out, and sending us into the scrap heap, which is what you might expect. The servant of the Lord comes to bring mishpat, and he does it gently. He mends those who are bruised, and he carefully fans back into flame the smoldering wick, so that it is of use again. He will be unlike anything this world has ever seen. And again, as we noted before in verse 4, he will do it through his law. Extraordinary. Through his teaching not by submission of force, but by his word. Words that somehow will enter into people's lives and change them and bring them back into order with God and order with each other. What a servant. What a beautiful picture. What a wonderful God who would give us one like this to be a covenant for the peoples and to be a light for the nations. 
And it is no wonder that as we read on in the next verses, verse 10, the world hearing about this servant is ecstatic with praise. Sing to the Lord a new song. Praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that fills it, the coastlands and their inhabitants. Let the desert and the cities lift up their voice. The the villages that Kedar inhabits, let the inhabitants of Selah sing for joy. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare his praise in the coastlands. And so we might expect, if this kind of savior, if this kind of servant would come to the world and bring God's world back into order, into a new world in this way, would not the world praise him with this kind of new song? We've been having our theme this afternoon as the unsearchable wisdom of God. What extraordinary wisdom there is from our God that he would bring about his rescue in this surprising way. One could never have imagined it this way. One could never have guessed that he would do it through a servant like this, one who is gentle and humble and meek. One who, with whom the Lord is well pleased. Those in exile, of course, look forward in time to the arrival of this servant. But the great elephant in the room, as it were, for us is that he has come. He has stepped out of the portrait and into reality and life. Jesus is that servant. He has come into the world. We read at the beginning of Mark's gospel that the Spirit of God comes upon him as he comes out of the water after his baptism. And God says of him, with him I am well pleased. Or in other words, a translation, a similar translation of the same verse that we've got here in Isaiah 42. He is the one in whom my soul delights. We don't have time now to do it, but I want to encourage us to take this beautiful portrait of the servant and see how at every syllable the New Testament shows us how he fulfills in his life this very thing. How at every moment we see in vivid and beautiful reality the servant has arrived and is doing and has done everything as predicted. If you're doubting your trust in the Lord. Think again about how 700 years before his arrival, God spoke with such incredible precision about the coming of this servant. And it's worth saying that his mission to bring about justice has begun. He's doing it in his world, releasing people from judgment, reordering lives individually and in groups across this world through his teaching, through his mere unimpressive outwardly, but deeply impressive and powerful word. And by his spirit, he is going about, through his word, doing that time and time again to northern Nigeria, to China, to the very ends of the earth. And that gives us pause and enables us to have great confidence in this servant as those who look back on it and see that the reality has come. And I think there is always this great challenge for us, whether we're Christian or not, to to doubt it. Because outwardly, it looks so unimpressive. It doesn't seem obvious He's not acting like the rulers of this world. But can't we see in Isaiah 42, that is exactly the way that he said it would happen. He wouldn't do it in the way of this world. Now, he wouldn't operate like the rulers of the the nations. He's not going to come loudly and brashly and with a show of outward power and crushing everything in his path. He doesn't come with a PR machine and tanks in the streets. No, he comes quietly and humbly and through his word. And through his word, he enters into people's hearts, and he unblinds eyes, and he turns people back to each other and to God, and he leads people out of the judgment of our sin, and he leads us into the light of the forgiveness that we need. He comes as a servant to serve us, not to oppress us, to bind us up as those who are bruised reeds, to flame us back into fire as those who are smoldering wicks. Don't be tripped up by his method because all this time ago, 2,700 years ago, the Lord said that is exactly how it would happen. Outwardly unspectacular, but in reality, bringing about the most wonderful and the most powerful and the most trustworthy and the most certain rescue that we need and that has come about through him. Let me lead us in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this picture of the great servant, 
the Lord Jesus all this time ago. And we pray that you would use us and that you would cause us to be those who trust in this picture, that the Lord has come, that the servant is a reality, and that despite outward appearances, he is working with great power to bring life and light to the nations. We pray that we would have opportunity to reflect more on his beauty, his gentleness, and his goodness to us. Amen.